talk. Delightful. So I am extremely um, thrilled to introduce Dr. Henry Siegerman um, for our 40 minute featured talk today. Um, Henry Siegerman is a professor of mathematics at Oklahoma State University, conducting research in the broad arena of geometry and topology. And he is very famous for his work in 3D printing of mathematical structures, a topic on which he literally wrote the book, um, Visualing Mathematics with 3D Printing. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's a beautiful book. Um, he is also a spherical camera enthusiast um, and has really pushed the boundaries of, of, of mathematics and film and video using spherical cameras. And he has a widely popular YouTube channel, which recently surpassed 100,000 subscribers. Um, so I am very, very excited to introduce Henry Siegerman. Um, I will pass the floor to you. Well, thank you for the lovely introduction, Gabriel. Let me try and share my screen and hopefully this will work. And now let me turn the slides on. Uh, let me know, is this is this working? Do you see everything? Yeah, looks good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, great. So, um, so yeah, thanks again for the the, the lovely introduction. Um, so, uh, I've done a bunch of stuff over the past. Oh gosh, it's been a while. I guess I started three D printing probably like fifteen years ago or something like that. Um, and there's a lot of stuff, and I keep making more stuff. And so this talk is just going to be like here's a whole bunch of stuff, and um, you know I'll talk a bit about this project and then move on to the next one and, and cover what I can in the next in the next 40 minutes. Um, so um, so let's begin um, with uh, this project. So um, so uh, in my sort of day job, I, I do uh, research in geometric topology and topology of three-dimensional manifolds usually. And so this is sort of like a nice transition between that kind of, you know, the, the more traditional topology research I do and uh, the visualization, the 3D printing work that I do. Um, and so, well, what is this thing here? This is, uh, well, it's a 3D print and you're supposed to imagine this as like a kind of big ball of dough or something. And then uh, I've trained a worm. I've I've got a very well-trained worm that can eat out of this ball of dough, this knotted tunnel. Um, and so the the result that you get once you sort of drill this knotted tunnel out is something called the complement of the figure eight knot, um, which is this sort of key example from um, hyperbolic geometry. Um, and I should mention um, much of the stuff that I do is joint work with other people. I won't always mention their names, but I'll always have, you know, the the... Who, who I worked on this with somewhere in the corner of the of the slide. Um, so so yes, yeah, so topology, uh, this is this sort of classic joke about topology is that topologists can't tell the difference between a coffee mug and a donut because you can continuously deform one into the other. And uh, so this was a fun project to actually print a continuous deformation between a coffee mug and and a donut. And this is, uh, there's lots of different um, 3D printing technologies. Uh, this one is actually printing in ceramic so that the coffee mug actually looks like a coffee mug. Although you'll notice that the handle here is pretty thick, which is was necessary. Um, so this is joint work with Keenan Crane, who's at CMU. And he sort of did the hard work of like, how do you come up with these shapes, right? When you're doing topology, you don't really care so much about the exact geometry. But when you're 3D printing, you actually absolutely do. You have to tell the, the computer or the printer, here's the actual geometry. So how do you get the geometry of this coffee mug turning into this um, this uh, this torus? And this used something called conformal Wilmore flow, which is a concept from uh, uh, differential geometry, which I won't get into. But uh, but that's that's how that's how Keenan did this, and then I sort of made this uh, the, the the 3D prints here. And um, it, the only thing that I'm a little sad about this is that this over here is indeed a ceramic coffee mug, but this is not a ceramic, sorry, this is a ceramic donut and it should be a donut donut. And so we just need a few advances in the technology so that not only can the shape transition between coffee mug and donut, but the material can continuously transition between ceramic and donut, but that doesn't seem to exist yet. Um, here's another uh, topological uh, 3D prints. So this time, uh, this is showing a braid. So, um, well, this is actually showing a braid and something else as well. 
So there's supposed to be three strands that are kind of braiding as we go up this direction. This is another picture from the side. This is a braid, but it's also illustrating um, a juggling pattern. So you're supposed to imagine you have three balls and you're juggling three balls in the usual cascade pattern. And you're also on a skateboard moving forwards. And this is kind of like a, uh, um, a multiple exposure photograph, but in three dimensions of, of, of that, uh, of what you would see. And so the, the balls follow this braiding pattern. And then actually you can see it in this picture down here. Um, there's also these, these little, um, there's these little cylinders, which are supposed to indicate the paths that your hands take um, as they're, they're throwing the balls back and forth. Um, here's another sort of juggling inspired uh, 3D print. This is just showing the path that a single club follows when you when you throw a club from one hand to the other. Um, and again, you take do a sort of multiple exposure um, photograph and you get these, it's a, you know, it's a very sort of simple or well, relatively simple motion, right? The club, the center of mass of the club is just following a parabola and it's rotating at constant speed. But then, then you get these like really beautiful um, uh, shapes that come out of this. And here sort of combining the two things together is three clubs that are being juggled. Um, uh, and I think here, yeah, you can't see from this photograph, but there's these little balls here that indicate where your hands are as, as they're, they're juggling the clubs. Okay, uh, more sort of topology. This is, uh, of course, one of the, the, the most common uh, kinds of object that people in three-dimensional topology think about are knots. And this is a trefoil knot or a particular way to draw the trefoil knot. So that the simplest knot there is other than the on knot, just the circle. And this particular shape has a, a an interesting uh, property, um, which is that it rolls. And if you saw, if you saw Laura Tarman's talk uh, recently, I think she was, I don't remember actually if she talked about this or not, but she certainly talked about this kind of thing before. But this is this was my version of the the rolling knot. Um, and, and I bring it up because, uh, I've been interesting in, interested in other rolling objects. So, uh, so this is me inside of a big metal rolling thing, um, which is not 3d printed. This is welded out of, out of, uh, out of metal. This is joint work with Lee Braswell. Uh, Lee is in the, uh, department of theater here at Oklahoma state. And, um, uh, I met him at one of these you know, faculty orientation things, which um, I was always kind of down on this, like, you know, am I going to get anything out of going to this lunchtime seminar, which is, you know, but anyway, in this lunchtime seminar, I met Lee and it was fantastic because we ended up making this big metal thing that you roll around. And so, so, so what is this about? Um, so Lee is interested in circus apparatus um, as part of his, his work in theater. And there's this big class of, um, uh, circus uh, performance skill where, well, you get inside of a big metal thing and you roll around on the stage. And um, there are a few sort of different variants of what kind of shapes you can make that and, and how do they roll around on the stage. And so there's some math in here of, of what you can do. Um, I'm not very good at, you know, hang, grab, grabbing the, the handles of this big metal thing and rolling around on, upside down. So instead, let me show you this video of somebody who does know what they're doing. This is Chris Delgado. Um, and you can see that he's rolling along. He rolls along sort of in a straight line for a while. And then there's a place in the motion where he can actually choose by leaning in one way or the other to continue rolling in a straight line or to sort of do this lane changing thing. So he just changed lanes here. And it turns out that he starts rolling clockwise and ends up rolling counterclockwise or something like this. And uh, the, the 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 mathematical puzzle here was how do you design the shapes of the um, or well, how do you design this structure so that it allows you to do these like different paths and uh, whilst maintaining that the center of mass you don't want the center of mass to bob up and down that's a bad idea if you're uh, asking a performer to use their body weight to control how it works and so on. All right, so this was a lot of fun. Okay, so so from one rolling. Thing to another well well-known rolling object dice um, and this is not exactly 3d printing these are injection molded so this is how most um mass-produced dice are made if you look in your board game probably the dice in there are made of injection molded plastic um, and we were the first to 
uh, make uh, and produce mass produced um, 120 sided dice. So, uh, so this is the, the, by reasonable standards, this is the most that you can do for a fair die, the most size that you can have. So um, it turns out that for, for fairness of dice, what you, what the property that you need for the die to be fair um, is that it has the right sort of symmetry, that um, all the faces are the same shape as each other, they're all, you know, their positions relative to each other, or the same as uh, in for, for all pairs of, uh, for, for all faces, you can make any face look like any other face. And so under that condition, that's some symmetry condition on the, the polyhedron that your die is going to be, uh, you sort of run out of geometry of ways to do this. If you want to do more than 120 sides, your only options, the only options that that uh, that mathematics provides for you is either uh, a prism with many, many, many very, very thin, shallow sides where, where the angles are very uh, small between, or very large, very close to 180 degrees between neighboring sides. So you have essentially a cylinder um, or you have two cones, which uh, or, or pyramids, I guess. And in either of those cases, once you're at 120 sides, it's just not going to work well, right? You're not going to be able to be able to tell which which face you're on if you're use, using like a prism or a double pyramid. Um, so this is about as big as you can go. And there are also some challenges in actually, you know, physically producing these things. And there's also an interesting mathematical challenge in how to do the numbering. So um, how do you number a die? Uh, so the the if you look at an ordinary six sided die. Um, the one thing that I think everybody knows is that opposite sides should add up to seven, right? So one should be opposite six and two should be opposite five and three should be opposite four. And okay, so we should do the same thing here. So 120 should be opposite one and 119 should be opposite two and so on. But that doesn't really reduce the possibilities very much. Um, so how do you choose what's a good way to do it? So um one of the what's it's not entirely clear historically what the reason is for why one is opposite six and two is opposite five why that's the the, the tradition but at least one plausible um reasoning for why dice are done this way is that it's a way to sort of uh, reduce the possibility of cheating so if you have a, a cubicle die and you kind of squeeze it down a little bit right you make it more like a coin in one direction so so you've got two sort of bigger square faces and and around the side, you have uh, four kind of smaller rectangular faces. Um, it's going to turn out that the more like a coin it is, the more it's going to show up. It's going to roll on the two bigger faces and the less it will land on the sides. And if you just do a little sort of imperceptible squeeze, it still makes a big difference to the probabilities in the end. And so by putting one opposite six, you know, you're going to maybe you, you're going to hit one and six more than you're going to hit the other numbers, but at least the the average that you're going to get, the average outcome uh, is not going to be high or low. So that's the idea behind that sort of balancing, or at least that's one theory of why historically dice have been made this way. So we could try and do something similar, some sort of some similar sort of ba balancing on these these dice, the numbers of the dice. You could say, you know, suppose that you know that uh, it's more likely that it's going to land on one of the 10 faces around this vertex here. Uh, maybe there's a big air bubble in here, or maybe somebody is trying to roll it in such a way that these 10 faces are more likely to come up. Then you could uh, you could hope that the average of the numbers around here is the same as the average of the numbers on the die. And so you could require, I want the average of all the numbers around each uh, of these vertices degree 10, they should be the same. Um, and so that puts some restriction. And then you could also ask, I want the average around the vertices degree six to also be the same as the average of the numbers on the die, so 60.5. And you could also require that the average around the degree four vertex is the same. And it turns out that there are solutions to this problem. It was not easy to find. We enlisted uh, Bob Bosch, who's in operations research at uh, Oberlin College. Um, so this is a big integer linear programming problem. So, or you can phrase it that way. And so he found he found the solution that we we ended up putting on the die. And it's not easy to, to, to figure out. You, you can't just sort of do a brute search, a brute force search. There's too many, too many numbers to look at. Um, the current status of this, um, uh, somebody else whose name I'm forgetting at the moment um, uh, has been using genetic algorithms to try and find more solutions to this problem. How do you number the dice? How do you number the sides of the 120-sided die? 
in this sort of balanced way. And there are currently millions of known examples, um, but we don't really know what the the larger structure. We don't certainly don't know all of them, and we're not sure, you know, exactly how many there are. So that's an open problem. How do you how do you number? What are all the num ways to number a hundred and twenty sided die? Uh, here are some other dice that that we made. So so I guess uh, sort of simpler in a way. Here's a six sided die, but you'll notice that it's kind of wrong, right? This is uh, uh, not the ordinary six sided die, but it turns out that this die is just as fair as your ordinary cubicle die. It has enough symmetry so that all the faces are the same and you can sort of change any face to, you can rotate your die around to turn any face into any other face. Um, but obviously it's um, sort of a disturbing idea that, that is this fair, are you sure? Um, and here's a version with 12 sided dice. Um, somehow, uh, so this is also skewed. Um, you can tell because Right, this, or maybe I can draw like this. This is not a regular pentagon, but it's kind of a little less obvious that it's that it, that it's not regular. Somehow it's a little harder to tell that there's something weird going on than it, than it is over here. I think because people know what cubes look like, but they don't really know what dodecahedra look like. And so it's kind of difficult to tell. And uh, eventually we, we, we ended up making skew versions of all of the, um, all of the, the, the standard Dungeons and Dragons set of dice. So um, uh, here's a four-sided die, which um, if you're familiar with the, the standard four-sided die, it's just a regular tetrahedron, it has the pointy side up. And so it's kind of difficult to put a number on the top face because there isn't a top face. But here with a skewed four-sided die, there is a top face, so, so we're winning there. Um, and I guess the other interesting one here is this thing over here, which is the most cursed 20-sided die I think you'll ever see. Um, with all of the other shapes, there's a way to distort the die very slightly and keep this fairness property, the, the symmetry property. It's called isohedral. Um, but the 20-sided 20, the, the 20 die, the icosahedron, there is no way to slightly deform it and still have it be fair. And so our only option was to produce this. The, this is the double pyramid design with two 10-sided pyramids. Um, so uh, sorry for, for doing this and inflicting this on the world. Um, more talking about symmetry. So... Uh, this is a sculpture um, that I uh, made with my brother, Will Sagerman. And this is, I mean, I guess it kind of looks sort of sy symmetric in a way. I mean, there are these different monkeys. They're actually, uh, there's a ring of four monkeys around here and another ring of four monkeys going around here. And uh, this is uh, symmetrical, not really in, in three-dimensional space, but it's actually symmetrical in four-dimensional space. And so this is a sort of three-dimensional shadow of a very symmetric configuration in four dimensions. So we call this four, more fun than a hypercube of monkeys. Um, the distortion of the, the monkeys is kind of, I mean, it's a little bit Dali-esque, you know, the Dali elephants with the long spindly legs. This wasn't intentional, which is just what the, the projection from four dimensions does to these monkeys. But so it's not my fault. Sorry about that. Um, so this is this is sort of based on uh, the hypercube, the geometry of the hypercube. Um, here's another sculpture with 24 monkeys. This is based on the uh, geometry of the 24 cell. This is another of the four-dimensional um, equivalents of the platonic solids. And here's another sculpture based on the 120 cell. Um, one of the uh, again another one is sort of the four-dimensional version of the dodecahedron, and uh, there is a um, virtual reality version of this, or if you go to monkeys.hypernom.com, which I will do right now, if I get this to work, then this is the sort of interactive version of uh, this, uh, this sculpture. So what's going on here is that there are, uh, you see the ring of sort of four lighter colored monkeys. And then uh, there's also going through infinity, hello, infinity. Um, <laughs> There's also a ring of the four darker colored monkeys. And this is sort of illustrating the symmetry that maybe wasn't so obvious initially is that every few seconds, you know, one monkey is turning into the next. Um, and and this is showing one of the, the symmetries, one of the ways in which these monkeys are all the same. Um, if you play with this yourself, the, the WASD keys and the arrow keys move you around. And then the numbers change between uh, the different uh, sculptures and the different sorts of monkeys. So... Um, let's see, where are we? So 
I don't remember what all of these are, but I think this is the 24 Solid Monkeys. Um, this is two sets of, yeah, so it turns out the 24 cell is self-dual. And what that means for us is that you can fit another set of 24 monkeys in the gaps left between the first set of 24 monkeys. And then this is the one with 120 monkeys um, based on the 120 cell. And again, you can see the symmetry, right? Every every couple of seconds, one monkey is becoming the next monkey. And there are many, many other symmetries. The four-dimensional version of the dodecahedron has a lot of symmetries. In fact, I think it's got the, the group is size 14,400. And this is just showing um, a, a small cyclic subgroup. Okay. Um, let me go back to my slides. If I can dodge. Here we go. So um, so I wanted to, um, I guess, do a little bit of philosophizing of, of you know, what is it that, that, that we're doing? What, what is a good way to illustrate or visualize um, a mathematical idea? And I wanted to illustrate that uh, uh, with what I think is maybe one of the, the more successful things um, that I've done, which is uh, this stereographic projection sphere. So you have this 3D printed um, sphere uh, with this curved pattern of lines on it. And then um, you put a light source, a point light source at the north pole of the sphere, and it casts this shadow down onto the, the plane with uh, where the, the curved grid is, is somehow turned into this ordinary uh, flat Euclidean grid. Here's a here's another photo of it. Um, and so, okay, so so what are some you know things that I think work well about this? So maybe the first thing is that there's there's sort of a surprise. There's a kind of a you know it, there's something strange happening here. There's something surprising. And if the viewer is is you know thinking what's going on with this magic trick, then you can then you've got them. Maybe you can explain some mathematics to them. Um, so, uh, well, I should explain what the mathematics is. Um, so this is illustrating something called stereographic projection. So this is so stereographic projection is a way of mapping the sphere onto the plane. So equivalent uh, or a similar sort of thing happens with you know anytime you have a map of the world, the the world is uh, the Earth is more or less a, a sphere, um, but you would like to have it uh, a map on a flat sheet of sheet of paper, and so a map does the same kind of thing as this. Um, stereographic projection um, is the map which goes from the sphere to the plane by, I mean, what do you do? You, you, you take the point at the North Pole, you draw a straight line inside of the sphere, it hits the sphere somewhere, and then that line continues on to hit the plane somewhere. And the map uh, that takes this, so the way that you map the sphere onto the plane is literally just where does it hit the sphere that maps to where to hit, hit on the plane. Um, and this was this was known to the ancient Greeks. Uh, some of the first maps of um, the stars were made with stereographic projection. Um, and it's not uh, so so if you've ever looked at the Mercator, Mercator projection, for example, um, it's a little bit complicated. There's some logs and 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 uh, things in there. How do you actually do this map? Stereographic projection is very simple. Um, you can write down a formula. Um, but uh, I guess another thing I like about this illustration is that you don't have to have a formula to understand what's going on, right? The light rays literally just do the mapping. So it's it's sort of very direct. You don't need a, a formula. Um, and there's something, um, I guess the physicality of of the, the 3D print is also, I think, a, um, a good good use of the medium. So you could absolutely you know, make a render of this picture um, on a computer and show the exact same thing. But I think people are sort of, you know, people can be suspicious of, of uh, computer graphics, right? You can do anything with, uh, you know, computer computer graphics in movies, you know, all kinds of fantastical things happen. You know, is this really happening? Um, well, okay, I'm showing, I'm, I'm showing you pictures over Zoom, so you could still imagine that I secretly rendered all of this um, offline and didn't actually do this in real life. But if you're there with, you know, in person with a piece of plastic and a flashlight, uh, uh, then, you know, there's no cheating, right? This this uh, this curvy grid is really turning into this straight grid. And so there's really some weird thing going on there. And so again, maybe you can you can uh, get people interested in, and want them to know what's going on. Uh, the last thing I'll say about this picture um, or this photograph is the, uh, the hand up here. So um, if I were to do this in real life, then uh, 
you'll you'll notice that the let me get rid of this you'll notice that the uh the shadow that you get is very sensitive to the position of the light so if you move the light just a little bit the shadow changes in, in a big way so i had to line this up very carefully and um so how did i get this photograph what's actually going on here right because if i'm holding it then how do i get the lines perfect what's actually going on is that the the flashlight is taped to a rod and there's a cross beam coming going across the top and then a couple of clamp stands either side and the hand is just sitting there it's it's purely decorative it's just there to sort of convince you that this isn't a computer render or if it is a computer render then i was pretty good at rendering a hand as well um and uh and it's not it's only there to sort of to tell you that that uh or to try and convince you that it's real, that it's not a computer render. Um, this is one of the one of the other problems with with uh, 3D printing. I guess with uh, this is not your usual desktop 3D printer. I use a, a service, an online service, to print these uh, um, many of the, the sculptures that I that I work with, and so you can't really see layers. It's hard to tell that it's not just like some white computer rendered surface, but it is real. Um, here are some some other sort of stereographic projection um, sculptures using. Uh, uh, so this is well, actually, this is only one uh, sculpture. This sort of hemisphere, and this is illustrating three different um, uh, projections or three different maps of the hyperbolic plane. So uh, maybe the most familiar is this one over here. This is the Poincaré disk model of H two, um, which you get from this hemispherical three D print by putting a the light at the sort of the north pole of the sphere. If you raise the light up very far, and so the light rays are coming down uh, parallel to each other, then you get the Klein model of uh, H2, of the, the hyperbolic plane. And if instead you put the, the, the flashlight is, is just down here at the equator um, of the, the hemisphere, then on the wall, you get another famous model, the upper half plane model. And um, so we did a whole uh, exhibition based around these ideas in 2017 in Edinburgh. Um, so this is like a four meter tall version of the grid. Um, over here, we had uh, we had lots of interactive things. So, so this is a globe, which you can rotate around, and the shadow that you get um, on the wall is well, it's the stereographic projection of of this globe. Actually, the globe in here has to be mirror from the usual, the usual, I guess, the actual globe. <laughs> the continents are mirrored so that on the shadow it appears the right way around. But you could sort of rotate it around to put your favorite uh, location in the center of the projection. And we had a uh, room full of tilings. Again, this is the this is the hemisphere we saw from before. And again, these were all sort of interactive. You could move things around. You could move the light in and out, and so on. And then the uh, the final uh, the finale of the of the exhibition was this. Um, I hoping hopefully the the animation is coming through okay. Um, the frame rate isn't too too bad. This is a zoetrope. So um, zoetropes uh, were sort of the 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 very first sort of version of movies, right? So maybe you maybe you've seen these like you have like a cylinder with slits cut out of it, and the cylinder spins around, and you look through the slits, and on the inside of the cylinder you see a sequence of of uh, cartoon pictures, and then when you spin this and you look through, you you have this illusion of uh, the animation. So this is um, uh, a modern version of that. So rather than looking through slits, there's a strobe light, um, which is timed um, to, to go off at exactly the right time. And these, uh, uh, these 3D prints are, you know, there's 30 3D prints that are mounted on a disc. It's about a meter across and it's spinning around and it's, and it's animating. And so actually what it's animating is uh, a rotating hypercube. And this is the same sort of rotation that the monkeys were doing before. So, um, so this, um, again, I should say, right, this is an illusion, right? The 3D prints are not actually deforming in this way. They're, they're rigid pieces of plastic. So this is something that looks like it's moving, um, but actually it isn't. And so let's transition to something that looks like it should move, but actually it cannot move. So, um, so this is, uh, uh, on the left, this is a photograph of a bus shelter in Manchester. I grew up in Manchester, England, and, uh, this is supposed to show, I don't know, three different transportation systems which are coming together and making, you know, transportation in the city work well. And if you think about this a little bit, you'll notice that there's a problem, um, which is that if, suppose gear one is going in this direction, and since gear one is meshing the teeth of gear one and meshing with 
gear two, gear two has to rotate in this direction. And that means that gear three cannot rotate in either direction. And so the whole configuration is frozen in place. Um, and so, you know, in fact, the city doesn't work well together at all. And here's another example. Um, the, the teachers, the students, the parents come together and no progress is made. Nothing is possible to do. Everything is just seized up. So, um, and right. And maybe at the, the university level, let's replace parents with the administration. And then, and then I think we're, we're good. So, okay. So there's sort of a challenge here, right? This, this graphic design element, you know, seems to show that there are these gears that are sort of meshed together and things work, but it doesn't work. So, so there's a, a challenge, make three gears which do mesh together in pairs, but they do work. And so here's the first version that uh, my collaborator Saul and I came up with. Um, the gears here are actually rings. So there's three rings. It looks kind of like a trefoil knot, but it's but it is not a knot. It is a it's made from three rings. And let me show you the the kind of animated or the the video version of this. It's maybe a little easier to see what's going on. There's an extra element here. There's a vertical helix which is going through all of the three rings which is sort of powering them but you can see that that these uh the rings here here you can see that two of the rings are meshing into each other and so they they all mesh together and they all they all work and well okay so it works um it's a little complicated um the the gears don't have axles it's anyway it's a, it's a sort of strange configuration uh, as is often the case the first example you find is maybe way too complicated so Here's a considerably simpler solution to this using, well, okay, it's not using gears, it's using racks, a sort of linear version of gears. So the, the racks slide back and forth, but again, there are three symmetric um, parts and each part gears into the other two. Um, here's a version with four. So this is sort of based on tetrahedral symmetry. There are four uh, racks here, which are all sort of sliding past each other. Um, and again, all four of them interact with each other or four of them mesh with each other. Um, here's a version with five, which is um, the current public record. I have a, another thing which, okay, maybe I won't talk about it. There'll be a video at some point in the future which, which has 12 of these things, but it's kind of cheating because there's other gears as well. Anyway, whatever, it, it, it'll be interesting. Um, but yeah, so five gears, which are sort of sliding past each other. So 3D printing, when talking about, um, you know, what's a good medium to do something in. So I'm showing you a lot of 3D printing things and I, and I sort of mentioned, you know, if you use computer graphics, then it can look like maybe you're cheating, right? If it's a real physical thing, it's kind of more, more believable that whatever you think is going on is actually going on. And I think mechanisms are, are, are also a very good um, use for 3D printing. If you show an animation of a mechanism, it's like, I mean, sure, okay, yeah, maybe maybe you you it works or maybe it doesn't actually work. And the way that you're animating it is actually a cheat. Whereas if it's a physical thing, then it then it really works. Um, so uh, so I've been interested in mechanisms in recent years. So I've been doing more and more kind of moving things rather than static sculptures. So this is um, a hinged. Uh, well, what is this? So so it's a hinged uh, mechanism. When it's flat on the table, um, you can see it's this sort of kind of like a parallelogram kind of thing. And then you can fold it up to make a torus. And so this is illustrating um, the, the, the fact that the sort of correct geometry on the torus is flat Euclidean geometry. So the fact that you can open this out onto the flat table, and there you can really see, oh, look, it's just Euclidean geometry, and you can fold it up to, to make the torus. Um, here's a sort of similar idea, but this time the geometry is not flat. Now it's hyperbolic geometry. So there's sort of too much stuff going on here. There are too many triangles filling up space. There's no way to lay this flat. Um, any way you try, you know, sort of flattening it down on the table in one place, it's going to bump up somewhere else. And it sort of likes to hang in saddles. So this is made from hundreds of little triangles, um, which were all 3D printed in place, right? So, um, uh, so there's a mathematical question. How do we design... Um, the shapes of these triangles to put into the 3D printer. When, it, when it's in the 3D printer, it has to be in position. Um, right? So I have to like find a position for all of these triangles to start with. And so the way that we did this was with a kind of iterative process. We laid the triangles out in the Poincaré disk model, um, which means that the combinatorics is correct. Things are connected together correctly. 
but the sizes of the, the lengths of the, the edges are, is incorrect. And then uh, you sort of like simulate the springs moving around. And in the end, you get this thing where all the, the triangles are equilateral. Um, well, for this version to make the, the, the model. The original version I showed you was not, actually they weren't all the same. There were some isosceles triangles, which helped sort of smooth out the curvature. Um, so more mechanisms. This is a, a, an expanding auxetic dodecahedron. Um, so here's a, a, a version, an expanding mechanism, which is based on diamond structure. This is of course similar to the Hoberman sphere, if you're familiar with that one. But here we, the idea was to have things tile in three dimensional, uh, in three dimensions rather than really just tiling over the, the surface of a two-dimensional sphere. Um, here's another mechanism based on the same sort of ideas, um, which is a grabber with which you can catch a tennis ball in mid-flight. Um, more mechanisms, this is with joint work with a undergraduate student um, here, Kyle van der Venter. So we were interested in two-dimensional scissor mechanisms, which are not just the sort of uh, kind of um, rectangular grid kind of thing that you could imagine you can make with scissor mechanisms. Here's another version uh, of the same sort of idea. And this, this came from, uh, the inspiration was looking at some pictures from hyperbolic geometry, it turns out. Um, here's a version of uh, Buckminster Fuller's jitterbug mechanism. So, well, these, these are sort of made out of Y shapes, but you can imagine this is made out of triangles instead. Um, and then it's sort of starting an octahedron when it's closed, and then it opens up to make a, um, a cube octahedron and then back down again. Our addition here was adding the gears and the gears kind of stabilize the mechanism and make it work better. Here's a version based on starting with a cube octahedron and then expanding out to a rhombic cube octahedron. Um, more kind of gear things. These are two gears which are connected together, but there's no axle between them. Um, they hold on without an axle and without a frame that, that connects them together. And here's the video to prove that there's no axle between them. You can put a, um, a screwdriver in between them and they still hold together. And here's uh, a version sort of following on from these with these three gears, which are always connected together, but it switches around which gear is in the middle. Um, so these are braiding gears. Here's a, uh, whoops. Hold on, come on. Is this going to play? Maybe not. Okay, you don't you don't get to see this uh, this video. I'm sorry, um, but this is uh, oh there we go. This is a um, uh, another geared mechanism which folds up a net of a cube into a cube with one degree of freedom. There's only one. Right. You could make this out of just paper, but then this version, if you make if you bend any of the edges, all of them bend together. Here's another. Um, uh, mechanism involving gears. This is another sort of expanding thing, mixing racks and gears. Um, he has a different configuration of the same sort of idea. This one, uh, the sort of translation instead of expansion, this is sort of swapping around uh, how, how the boxes work um, and you get a different effect. Uh, this is uh, sort of gearing involving uh, screw motion rather than rotation. Um, so uh, ordinary gears, they, both gears are rotating. Uh, a rack and pinion mechanism, one is rotating and the other gear, if you like, is translating. We saw two translations and this is two helical motions. Here's another view of the same thing um, from another side. Um, I'm running a little short on time, so uh, maybe I'll go kind of quickly through the rest of it. So um, I'll just show you a few things. This is the, the classic 15 puzzle. This is a version of the 15 puzzle that has another four tiles jammed into the first set of them, um, which has some interesting properties, um, which I won't go into. Here's a version where um, every vertex has five squares around it rather than just the one in the middle um, and complicated things happen. Here's a puzzle based on holonomy, um, which is the effect that when you sort of go around uh, a loop on a curved surface, you can come back rotated and that does complicated things to whether or not you can solve this puzzle. Um, here's a version based on the dodecahedron with, again, the idea of this, the idea of this puzzle is to get the little piece out 
but there's only certain ways you can move it because of these pegs and the arms on the piece. Um, and here's a sort of computer render of what's going on with that. Um, here is a version, same sort of idea with a piece that you can move around, except now we're doing it on a hyperbolic surface instead of a spherical surface. And that changes how holonomy works. You rotate in the opposite direction instead. Um, here's a version of the 15 puzzle sort of combining these ideas together. So this is based on, um, uh, again, the, the holonomy uh, means that as you sort of move tiles around, things get rotated. And this is we start with the earth and then you mix, mix it up and you have to get it back to the, the, the correct position again. But again, as you move these things around, the tiles are going to rotate in annoying ways. You not only have to get them in the right positions, you also need to get them rotated correctly. Um, uh, here's a few things about projections and optical illusions. So an object that casts three different shadows. There's a classic cover of Gerdel Escher Bach, which uses the, the same idea, the Gerdel Escher Bach by Hofstadter. Um, oh, yes. And there, it's real. It's not a computer render. Um, here's uh, a fun illusion kind of thing. On the right is the view from the camera. On the left is the sort of uh, the outside view. So you can see what's going on. So this is an object that looks like a circle from one direction, and it looks like a square from the other direction. Um, the classic optical illusion of the impossible triangle. Um, and here you go. It's, it's real. Uh, but in a couple of seconds, I'm going to show you how it's done. There you go. It's actually cheating. Um, this is the Ames room. So the classic illusion of the Ames room is what appears to be an ordinary cubicle room, except that somehow it's not. <laughs> um, and if you stand inside of it, you're you're you you look different size depending on where you are. Um, here are some illusions involving knots. This looks like an ordinary truffle knot, but in fact it is not an ordinary truffle knot. It's cheating somehow. Um, there's trickery hidden behind uh, the strands. Uh, here's a version. It, on the left, you see what appears to be just uh, a figure eight, an unknot, but on in the mirror, you can see that it's actually knotted. And so here we can rotate from one to the other. Uh, so yeah, again, from that perspective, it looks like just a figure eight, but from the other perspective, you can see that it's knotted. Um, here are some... Uh, fractal zooms I was playing with. Uh, you can see the inset in the top left. The camera is uh, fading from one position to another, and you have to slow down exponentially to make this work. Um, here's a rotating version. Uh, and again, I don't know how good the frame rate is. Um, here's a version which has a laser, just because <laughs> because you can. Uh, the, the laser doesn't... Uh, uh, you, you can transition from one to the other. Works. Here, here's a version with the laser in, in the darkness, um, which looks super cool. Uh, this is the latest version. The latest thing that I've got, the video doesn't exist yet. This is like a sphere made out of cyclides that opens up to make a disc. So this was designed, uh, or the, 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 the mechanism, the idea of the mechanism comes from Andrew Keppert, and he nerd sniped me into making this version. Yeah, I'm almost out of time. Let me just finish off with um, uh, seeing things is not as good as making them yourself. Uh, watching somebody else do something, do something is not as, you're not going to learn as much as if you do it yourself. So I have a 3D printing lab in the math department here, and I teach a course um, for, which is sort of 3D printing for math majors. Um, and this is the homework from week three, I think, you, you know, find a, find a cool parametric curve and make a 3D printer of it. So these are work from some of the students that I have, I've had in, in different iterations of this course. It's a project-based course. You get to make things and, and, you know, do some, some creative making as well as get stuck in some difficult mathematics without knowing that you're about to get stuck into them. Uh, this, this is a version. Um, these are sort of illustrating Fourier series. Um, and so, so approximations to the, uh, saw wave and the the, squ uh, the square wave. And this is a, a approximating, um, this is the Weierstrass. Um, one of the Weierstrass functions is trying to, trying to get a, uh, showing how that's built up out of parts. And let me finish with 
uh, this quote by George Hart, um, which I like a lot. The more math you know, the more stuff you can make. So absolutely. And uh, with that, I'll stop. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Henry. Um, I want to take a moment to open the floor for questions. So you can type questions in the Q&A or click the raise hand button or post your questions in the seminar discard cord to give Henry some time to respond. But I wanted to share one question from the Q&A box, um, which asks, it was from Steven Stadnicki who asks, um, how much mechanical design work do you have to go through to ensure that the mathematics of these models work correctly in the physical prints, especially with things like tolerances on hinges and right. gears and such? Yeah, there's definitely um, some some years of experience of, of finding out what works and what doesn't work. Um, yeah, I mean, when when I was uh, when I was mostly doing static objects, you know, I it got to the stage where I know this is going to work. I'm going to print it once and it's going to work. When with mechanisms, very, very frequently, there's multiple iterations. Um, there's certainly, you know, knowing, okay, I'm going to make a hinge using an M3 bolt. What kind of clearance do I need on the, the shaft of the bolt if I'm going to be using this kind of printer? Um, those are things that you just sort of learn or, you you know, you run some test things. But then, yeah, absolutely, you know, is this thing going to flex? Um uh, maybe maybe the worst for this the 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 worst of these these versions of the uh well the worst kind of project were these expanding mechanisms with many um interlinking um parts anytime you have a lot of parts in a long sequence no matter how good your precision is things are going to start jiggling and the and the longer you get the more parts in a sequence the more jiggly it will be and the worse it's going to get and so and the further it gets away from the, the mathematical precision there are certainly, you know, there's big areas of engineering where people, you know, study these problems and worry about, you know, the parts are going to flex. And I've just sort of, at least so far, I've always stayed away from it. It's like, I'm just going to pretend, I'm going to close my eyes and cover my ears and pretend that everything is just rigid mathematical objects working perfectly. And when it isn't, then I'll, you know, complain and try something else. But but I, I haven't got into, you know, you can real, you know, you you do like finite element analysis on, you know, all kinds of things. Um, but yeah, I haven't got into that. But yeah, there's a right. Somehow I've ended up doing engineering. <laughs> I didn't intend to do, but but here we are. If you want to make it real, you have to deal with you have to deal with the real world. Oh, do I need to stop sharing? Sharing. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Great, thank you so much. Um, also in the Q&A, someone shared a Reddit thread with a bunch of non-Euclidean games. So I figured I would share that in the chat as well as the Discord. Um, perhaps um, if there aren't any more questions, um, we might transition over to the Discord. Um, Aaron, would you like to take us home? Uh, yeah, just to say thank you once again, everybody, for coming. Thanks to the speakers for, once again, beautiful presentations. Um, if you are not here um, and you want to catch up, there's a YouTube channel where um, this talk will be posted eventually. Previous talks uh, in the seminar are posted now, so I just put that in the chat as well. And uh, hope to see you all next month. Thanks again. Thanks.